Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you all uh, for being here today. So I have been set up for failure by this presentation by everybody who put on this uh, program. But I want to thank all of y'all for being here today. Very appreciative. And Mr. Diaz said one thing. He said that what makes you a badass is running into a building, uh, running into bullets. That's just one piece that makes you a badass. The other piece that makes you a badass is being able and being willing to go seek that treatment when you need it. Okay. Recognizing, hey, I've got a problem here. That running into a building, a burning building, and carrying babies uh, with broken femurs, doing that for 10, 20 years, that affects you. We see that every day in our office. In our office, we prosecute those heinous crimes that the law enforcement officers are investigating. And we see those victims, and we seek justice for those victims. But the other issue that we see are we see officers who are having to respond to this, and officers who are having to relive that event along with that victim. So first off, I want to thank every single one of the law enforcement first responders, but I want to also thank those individuals here who help the law enforcement and first responders, those social workers, those case managers, those counselors, those clinicians that are there with law enforcement when they need the help. All of y'all are badasses, and I want to thank y'all very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to be as serious as Mr. Diaz was. I, uh, oh, I forgot. The peer support specialist. Peer support, I just recently learned kind of how big that was and how important that is. And so I wanted to add that to the group as well. And probably everybody else that I missed. So uh, my name is Thomas Wilson. I am with the uh, Smith County District Attorney's Office here in Smith County. And I have a caveat here that I want to mention is, first off, I represent Smith County in um, mental health proceedings and civil commitment proceedings in the county court. So if you or a loved one, or any number of individuals have involvement with the county court and have involvement with a civil commitment process, I will be the one to process those cases. With that being said, um, it's a, uh, we have individuals probably from other counties. So what I say applies here in Smith County. There are people uh, who do my job throughout the state. There are 254 counties. There are probably more than 254 other uh, people, attorneys who do the same thing that I do. Now, when they give advice, they may be wrong, but <laughs> what I say goes here in Smith County. So if you are out of another county that is not here in Smith County, I would say if you have a question that is of a legal nature, uh, take that to the DA or the county attorney in that county who represents uh, the state in those proceedings. So why am I here? Why am I, uh, why are we all, uh, there we go. Why are we here? Why does this cat look this way? How is this cat sitting up? <laughs> but those are questions that we all have. Um, I am not here to answer those questions. But what I'm here to do is to talk about the court-ordered mental health services and specifically two types of uh, processes that we deal with in the county court. Uh, the first is going to be your emergency detention under, or POW, under 573001. That is what most officers know of as the mechanism to take someone to the hospital on a POW. So how many... Uh, Police officers from, or police officers do we have in the room today? Retired. Retired? Okay, so we got a few. Uh, so I'm sure all of y'all at some point in your career have done a POW. Right? So POW, sometimes they call it EDW, sometimes they call it whatever acronym they want to come up with. But I'm going to refer to them as POW, that's what we call them here in Smith County. That's a peace officer's warrant. The second thing that I'm going to talk about today is Health and Safety Code 573.011 and 012. And that is the judge's order. Now there are some counties that don't really use the POW process and they go straight to the judge's order. That is their, that's not right, that's not wrong, that's just how they do it. That is another mechanism 
to get someone to the hospital. And really, that's what the whole goal of this is, is to get someone so that they can get to the hospital, so that they can get the treatment that they need because they are in a crisis. Now, at the DA's office, we don't always deal with these type of cases. Sometimes it's criminal, sometimes it's civil. Um, here, in this, we're talking about the civil commitment process. And really, what this is, is this is the beginning of the civil commitment process. And there are other uh, commitment processes. I'm sure all of y'all have heard about the forensic wait list. Anybody not heard of the forensic wait list? The forensic wait list is basically if you or someone commits a crime and they are incompetent to stand trial, and a doctor has deemed them incompetent to stand trial, they will get on a wait list to go to a state hospital. Now, if you don't know, that backlog for Smith County is over two years long for some cases that we have. That is a statewide problem. And the fact is, the state has uh, initiated a lot of programs to kind of alleviate that backlog. But we still have that backlog, they're still sitting in the jail, and we have to do something with them. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, but that is one process for a, civil co for a criminal commitment. The other process for a criminal commitment would be your 46C, or your insanity defense uh, commitment. We have a few of those in Smith County, but the focus today is the health and safety code and the civil commitment process. So what does that look like for y'all? or for law enforcement, or for anyone. That is the emergency apprehension and detention. So within 48 hours, uh, I'm sorry, they have to be detained for 48 hours when they're picked up on a POW. So law enforcement responds to a suicide call or to a, uh, a person walking naked in the street. I will tell you, that happens all the time. Uh, we've had cases where a lady was sitting naked on a state highway holding a katana and it took like katana is a one of those japanese swords and, and she was swinging uh, and she uh, did not want to go into custody so those are the type of calls that we respond the officers respond to on a pow and that pow lasts uh 48 hours so within 48 hours the hospital has to see that person the local mental health authority has to say Yes, there's a bed available for them, and I will say there are a lot of beds, but there are not a, there there are beds, there are not a lot of beds, and that is a statewide problem. Now, fortunately, in Smith County, you have uh, some very very good and forward-thinking people who are looking to get more beds. So we petitioned the legislature for more beds at our hospital. Hopefully within this legislative session, we will have the videographers mad at me because I move around all over the place. <laughs> so here. Um, hopefully, during this legislative session, we will get some appropriations to, to make, get more civil beds, to get more forensic beds. So within that 48 hours, the LMHA, Local Mental Health Authority, has to give us those beds or say, yes, let's go. Uh, move them into that bed. Sometimes they will sit in the hospital for hours. I give this presentation to CIT training, to law enforcement. Uh, here in Tyler, I've had law enforcement come from all over the state. And my one question I ask is, what's the longest time you've had to sit on someone in the hospital on a POW? I have had, the, I believe the longest was four days. Now, four days, that exceeds 48 hours. So how does that happen? How do you get four days out of 48 hours? Well, what they wind up having to do eventually is do nothing and hope that nobody sees it and nobody says anything, or they have to get another POW and then another <coughs> POW, and that's called a stacking of POW. We, I'll talk about that in a little bit if, if we have time, uh, but there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong about it <coughs> as long as there's certain criteria is met. Within that 48 hours, the doctor must evaluate the individual for uh, within 12 hours. 
So within 12 hours of being seen by a uh, being taken to the hospital, a doctor must then evaluate them. Um, then we have the probable cause hearing. So the probable cause hearing is basically the next step in this process. After the law enforcement officer takes the individual into custody, they are detaining them against their will most of the time, and they're taken to the, to the hospital, and we have to have a hearing, uh, or have to, not have a hearing, but have to set a, uh, don't necessarily have to have a hearing, but we have to have an order to detain them. And we get the order of protective custody based on the fact that they are at substantial risk uh, to harm themselves or others. So what happens after that? So we get the probable cause hearing, right? We have a probable cause hearing and we get a commitment. Maybe they waive it. Uh, and they do have an attorney that represents them also. So you have one contract attorney here in Smith County who represents all of these uh, patients in these commitment processes. And we can hold them up to four, 14 days. It's a mini trial. We can have witnesses, we can have evidence, we can present uh, uh, testimony, we can uh, present physical evidence if necessary. Uh, then we have a final hearing. In that final hearing, they can request a jury trial in that process. Now, Donna Henry's here. She's the court coordinator for the county court of law, county court, uh, who handles these matters. We've had one jury trial in the 10 years that I've done this. And I will tell you from experience, and I will admit my faults, um, I lost that jury trial. And I lost that jury trial because the jury was upset with my doctor who testified. My doctor, uh, he came across and he thought he knew everything. And he said, I know that person has a mental illness. I don't even have to evaluate him. And so at that point, the jury said, well, I don't like this doctor. And so we're going to release him. So uh, jury trials do happen in, this, uh, in these instances. They don't happen very often. We can get a, uh, an extension, uh, so we can do a, get, get a couple of uh, uh, extensions on the 45 days and 90 days. Um, at that point, we can also force medications. Uh, that requires two physicians, and I forgot to mention this, the probable cause hearing does not require two physicians. It only requires one. At the final hearing, it requires two physicians and a uh, or one physician and a psychiatrist. Uh, the forced medication application basically means they can force their medications. As we all know, a, a lot of the individuals who are going through a psychotic episode, uh, they may not be wanting to take their medications for any number of reasons. So we have that option available to us. We do also have extended mental health commitments. I will say we probably have about four or five that I can think of off the top of my head that we have done year after year. I think there's two that I have done for 10 years since I've been here. And these are people who are institutionalized, they are hospitalized, they live in the hospital, and we just, we do commitments on them annually. So uh, that one is an automatic jury trial unless waived. Uh, usually that is waived. Now, the burden of proof that we have to prove in these cases is a little bit different. Uh, I know, you know, law and order, but if you're older, LA law, whatever other thing that you watch uh, to, to learn about the criminal process, right? You, you hear about the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So what do we have to prove in these cases? Well, the first thing that we have to prove is probable cause. Is there a probable cause to, well, I gotta pull this out too, because I cannot, remember the exact definition, even though I'm supposed to. Uh, is there a probable cause to detain this person? And so what's the definition of probable cause? Probable cause is a reasonable, reasonable, trustworthy facts within the officer's knowledge that is sufficient in and of themselves to warrant a reasonable person in the belief that the offense is being committed. Straightforward, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, in law school, I learned probable cause as that quantum of information that leads a reasonable person to believe the crime is afoot. I remember that. That makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, lawyers are not as smart as we think they are. So just, I, I'll admit that right here. Then the next level in, in burden of proofs that we don't have to get is in civil cases. This is a civil case. These type of cases are civil cases. But they're not your traditional civil cases. So your slip and fall, your car accident, 
Uh, any other type of civil case other than uh, removal of children from a uh, home requires a preponderance of evidence. This one is a lot easier to define. The preponderance of evidence definition is 51%, right? a, a little more uh, than half of the information leads you to believe that, oh yeah, that actually happened. For these cases, we have to prove clear and convincing. So clear and convincing means we have to have sufficient evidence to show with a degree of proof that will produce a firm belief or conviction in the truth of the allegations being sought. So we have to prove several things. We have to prove a mental illness. We have to prove that they are either in the, in the uh, final commitment hearing process, that they are either a danger to themselves, a danger to others, or there's a third criteria that is only available in this final hearing or extended hearing that is what I call the gravely disabled standard. And so what that boiled down to is that you have to prove by clear and convincing evidence that they are unable to do their ADLs, their activities of daily living, and that affects them so much that they cannot remain independent in society without some sort of medical uh, uh, or uh, mental health intervention. So we have to prove that by clear and convincing evidence. And that's why this information that I'm going to provide is very important, especially from my standpoint and from a law enforcement standpoint, because I need all of the information that law enforcement can provide to me. I need all of the information that the Andrews Center can provide to me. And we see a lot of these, uh, a lot of our packets that we get have both medical information in it from the hospital. It has the law enforcement POW in it. It has some of the Andrews Center uh, information in it. And I will say this, and it's probably no secret, because mine is just as bad. Everybody's handwriting is important. <laughs> it is, I mean, it, and attorneys are just as bad as clinicians. Man, y'all need to work on that. <laughs> I mean, so it, it is hard to read. Uh, but that is why it's important that you know all of this and what that burden of proof is so that you can actually say, okay, as a law enforcement officer, what do I need to provide the DA's office so that they can get this uh, uh, commitment moving forward? So first we'll talk about a mental illness. So that's really what it's, what it's guiding all of this, right? So everybody here know what the DSM right, is, right? Okay. What number are they on? Five, okay. D DSM-5, what is that? What is the DSM? What does that tell you? Diagnosis? What is it? Yeah. The criteria for what is a mental illness. So that tells you as a clinician what a mental illness is, what to look for, uh, what, what, to, what to see, uh, what, you know, how to treat it. Uh, I don't, does it tell you how to treat it? Yes. No? Uh, the state of Texas, in its infinite wisdom, has defined the mental illness as this. And this is a little different than what the actual statute is because I, uh, last minute, and Keisha's mad at me and so is Stephanie, last minute I made a change to my PowerPoint. So it's actually an illness, disease, or condition other than epilepsy, dementia, and alcoholism, substance abuse, or a mental deficiency. So you have to take this out and replace senility with dementia and alcoholism with substance abuse. So as read by the statute, it says an illness, disease, or condition other than epilepsy, dementia, substance abuse, or mental deficiency that substantially impairs the person's thought, perception of reality, emotional process, or judgment, or grossly impairs the behavior by uh, demonstrated by recent disturbed acts. That is, I guess, the legislature's way of boiling down the DSM-5 into three sentences. That encompasses every mental illness that you can think of, right? So if you have schizophrenia, is that the medical definition of schizophrenia? Is that the medical definition of bipolar disorder? So uh, the legislature has decided to put a square peg into a round hole and make it work. 
is the best way I can describe it. Now, I will say uh, they changed the alcoholism and senility in 2017. So up until then, it said, other than epilepsy, senility, dementia, alcoholism, or a mental deficiency. So with all of that being said, we are working in a world, I am working in a world, law enforcement is working in a world that does not mesh well with what the medical definition of a mental illness is. It is hard for us, for me as the, the prosecutor for these cases, it is hard for law enforcement to say, well, this mental illness is a mental illness because of, and then spit off all of these, you know, uh, different reasons for criteria of why it is bipolar disorder versus schizophrenia. Why it is schizoaffective disorder versus schizophrenia. Why it is substance abuse or what is it? Um, co-occurring, co-occurring. Somebody correct me. Co-occurring poly substance abuse. Why is it that versus? Why isn't it just schizophrenia? So in, in the classes that I teach to law enforcement, I really like to focus on, look, you're not out there trying to diagnose someone with schizophrenia. But the legislature says that we have to. Don't focus on the mental illness. Don't focus on, oh, is this schizophrenia? Oh, is this bipolar disorder? We, we see that all the time. I see that and you know, and I'll, I'll read POWs and it'll say um, diagnosed with schizophrenia. Okay, how do you know that as a, as a cop, right? You really don't, you're hearing that from uh, some third party. So you have to say in your uh, probable cause affidavit or in your um, POW, you say mother said they're diagnosed with schizophrenia, something to that effect because this is what I tell them. I say, look at the signs and symptoms of what a mental illness is. So we got their physical state, their appearance, their behavior, their posture, their hygiene, their mannerism, emotional state, uh, affect, uh, speech, I had, uh, flow of thought, um, flow of disturbances. Uh, it used to be when I started out in this, and I think Donna can attest to this, um, the black helicopters used to fly around and they used to be the ones that were following some of the, uh, it was a part of the psychosis and a part of the delusions. And in the past probably five or six years, it has morphed from black helicopters to drones. So you, it's funny how you can see a societal change in even some of the delusional thought processes that these individuals have. But really, when I look, when I talk to law enforcement officers, I said, I, my, my focus is, you don't want to focus on schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder. You want to focus on what you're seeing at the time. Are they oriented? That's a huge, huge uh, uh, thing that I would like to know when I'm reviewing these cases. Uh, what is their, um, or what are their delusions? What are their, what are specifically, what is their thought process? So when we talk about these peace officer warrants, what we're really talking about is 573.001 of the Health and Safety Code. And that says that a peace officer without a warrant may take a person into custody regardless of the age of the person. I think this is a common misconception that we have, that law enforcement has, that the general public has, that a lot of people don't know about. If the officer believes that the person does not uh, evidence a mental illness, uh, or does, I'm sorry, believes that the person evidences a mental illness, a substantial risk to harm to self or others, or a risk of imminent harm unless they're immediately restrained. So I'm going to go back a little bit and point out, as an attorney for the DA's office, as a prosecutor, I was trained, and probably law enforcement was always trained. Unless you see that offense occur, or unless you have specific facts, and you are questioning whether or not you should detain this person, then the answer is, go get a warrant. And every time, as a prosecutor in criminal cases, somebody would come to me and they would say, hey, I have this offense here, and this happened, and this happened, and here's what happened. 
uh, what should I do? My answer is always, 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 go get a warrant. Because a warrant is what, under the Constitution, allows law enforcement in the state of Texas to detain you, to, take, uh, to seize items from you when they believe that a criminal offense has occurred. But then when I moved over here, I had to kind of get rid of that to the civil division because in certain circumstances, especially in this, the police officer is the one making that decision. And they're making that authority, and they're given that authority under the Health and Safety Code 573001. A lot of, uh, you know, a vast majority of the civil commitment cases, probably statewide, but I know in Smith County, come from a peace officer's warrant. And the peace officer has to make a snap judgment. They have to make a quick judgment at that time. Because as an officer, they're trained. Hey, first and foremost, I gotta protect myself. I gotta protect the people behind me. I gotta protect the, uh, my, um, my, uh, oh, I'm slipping my mind now, my partner. I've gotta, my goal is to protect them. And so if somebody, if they're responding to a call and somebody's suicidal with a knife or with a gun, that's their first goal, is how can I make sure that I go home safely and protect myself, the bystanders, and everybody around me. And so having to process this, having to say to a law enforcement officer, we want you to protect the, yourself, everybody, and this person is a difficult task. And so, but we've given them that task, and the legislature has given them that task and that ability through 573-001. And that's a hard concept for a lot of people to understand. And it's a hard concept to see when, you know, that you see as a bystander somebody being, as they say, escorted to the ground because they have a, a, a knife. And it's not because they are, uh, they are trying to harm them. They're trying to uh, remedy the threat that is currently present. And my hope is that law enforcement can respond by instead of taking them to the jail, that they can, in certain circumstances, take them to a mental health facility. And we've done that here, and we've done that through 573-001, and we've given them the tools to do it, but we ask a lot of law enforcement in this process. So the other, um, the other big thing, we talk, I get calls all the time. Well, the guy's 15 years old and he's suicidal. I have to, I have to get the parents to take him to the hospital. Well, no you don't, no. You can, as a law enforcement officer, they can take them to the hospital on a POW. Now, we can't go through the commitment process. There's a whole other process for that. But they can take them to the hospital. So that's a big misconception, even among the community that we have at large. Um, so I'll go back. Uh, evidence of the mental illness and a substantial uh, risk of serious harm to self or others. And the risk is imminent. So what is the substantial risk to serious harm to self or others? And how do they see that? How does a law enforcement officer see that? Well, they look at the behavior. Severe emotional distress. Deterioration. We have so many uh, situations and so many what we call frequent flyers around town that you know, law enforcement officers already know. I, I, okay, I'm, I'm responding to this call. I know who it is. I'll be there. They've deteriorated at this point. They were good. They were on their medications two weeks ago when I talked to them. Now they're not. So they can use that to show a deterioration that they are a substantial risk to self or others. And they cannot remain at liberty. So what does a substantial risk mean? Everybody, blaze of glory. <laughs> One of the most underrated Will Ferrell movies you will ever see. And underwhelming too. Uh, so what is a substantial risk, right? Obviously we have suicide attempts. Right? You attempt suicide, cut your wrist. I actually just, signed, while I was sitting here earlier, signed a, uh, an application on a suicide attempt. Uh, they submitted, POW was, uh, individual was taken to the hospital on a POW. 
they submitted it to the court and we're moving through the process and she attempted to slit her to kill herself by slitting her wrist so obviously that's a uh, a sign of uh, a danger to self or others. It's not an inclusive list. You can have assaultive behavior. There are lots and lots and lots of offenses that are committed by individuals where they need to go to jail. Assaultive type offenses where somebody, you know, they're going to have to go to jail. And this is not, like Mr. Diaz said, this is not a get out of jail free card. This is a process for individuals. They may be assaultive. Uh, but you know, we have to uh, uh, we have to process the case like we uh, like we should, and sometimes that entails an arrest. Sometimes that entails a uh, a hospital trip. Psychosis induced action. Uh, they did not understand the uh, nature of their offense or what they're the consequences of what they're doing because of their psychotic state. Uh, inability to perform ADLs. Now I will tell you this. Um, that alone may not get you a POW. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. It really depends on the policy of the agency that, uh, that, of where that officer is. Um, here in our court, I will present in certain cases a case to a court, to the court where the individual cannot perform their ADLs and they cannot uh, uh, function independently because of that, because of their mental illness. But there, that's, it, just, it really depends on the court and the agency. So the peace officer may obtain from the belief that the person meets the criteria for apprehension from a credible person. So this is a big sticking point as well. Uh, a credible person. What is a credible person? So I, I get all the time, I get, look, he came to me and he said he wasn't suicidal. He said he, he really did, he was just kidding. He didn't want to kill himself. And so, you know, I didn't feel like we had enough to take him to the hospital. You know, and plus, he didn't say it to me. I didn't hear him say it. I didn't see it happen. And my response to that is always, how many theft cases, how many assault family violence cases are defendants arrested based on a credible person or a report from a credible person. And so when an officer responds to Walmart because of a theft and somebody stole $500 worth of whatever they, uh, uh, whatever they wanted to steal at that point in time, that officer is 99.9% .9 of the time responding to a call based on a report from a credible person. So that is no different than these type of situations where you get a call because someone is walking naked in the street, uh, walking with their back to traffic, and they are, uh, they're now, they've moved on, and they're now sitting on the road with a shirt on and underwear on, so they're no longer naked. But, or maybe even they have, they're fully clothed now. Um, but the officer has to make a choice. Okay, who reported that? Was it a bystander? Uh, could it have been the local mental health worker who was responding, uh, the crisis uh, uh, worker who was responding to a call for a crisis? You know, the officer needs to take all of that into consideration when they're responding to those calls. Uh, and then, or on the basis of conduct of the apprehended person and the circumstances under which they were found. Well, that's pretty, pretty clear. Um, you know, what did they look like when they got there? What did they smell like? Uh, how did they react? Um, the peace officer shall immediately transport or apprehend the person to the nearest appropriate mental health facilities. So, we, you hear this all the time. The jail is the largest mental health facility in your county. And it is. It is the largest mental health facility in our county. But it is not the most appropriate mental health facility. So, uh, there are counties throughout this state, especially in West Texas, they do not have a facility to take people to. There are counties here in East Texas that do not have a facility to take people to. That is why Tyler is a hub of a lot of this activity on the civil commitment end. And I forgot to mention this earlier, but typically in, here in Smith County, we have about three to five 
mental health commitments a week. Now, that doesn't mean that we're doing five mental health hearings, but we have at least three to five applications that come through our county court at a time. And that is because we are the nearest appropriate mental health uh, facility. UT Health is the, the big one. Uh, Christus is the other one. Uh, 271, the, the UT Health out on 271, they have a uh, large, uh, they have our, they are our, where we send most of our patients to. Some of the people go to private facilities. And so that'll be Dallas, uh, Montgomery County. We've had a few, I think, go to Palestine Regional. But for the most part, if you're in Wood County, if you're in Van Zandt County, um, Henderson County, I think most of them come here. So we get a lot of our regional uh, other county uh, patients come in through here uh, to Smith County. Uh, peace officers shall immediately file an application for detention. So and, and it says that they must, the, the statement must contain that evidencing a mental, a statement's evidencing a mental illness. And that goes back to that very first definition that I was talking about. And when I was talking about law enforcement has to determine whether or not they have a mental illness. That's what the legislature is saying. The legislature wants law enforcement to do that. They, they're asking law enforcement to determine if there's a mental illness. Or at least show that there's evidence of a mental illness. A substantial risk to harm to self or others. You can't just have that third criteria, that gravely disabled criteria. You have to have a substantial risk to harm to self or others. They have to describe that risk, uh, that the risk is imminent, imminent, specific behaviors, overt acts, or attempts, or threats, and a detailed description of the specific acts, uh, behaviors, or threats, and the name of who reported. All of that has to go in to our POW when we receive it. The other, uh, the convenient thing, I'd say one of the best things the legislature did and they made it easy for every law enforcement agency, from DPS to a sheriff's office to a city police to a city marshal's office to a school resource officer, is they gave you the form. This is the actual form for a POW. If you want to go look it up, it is in 573, and it gives you everything you need. Now, I will say this. One thing it does not have. If you're trying to specifically describe the harm, you got a line and a half. So, uh, and those are handwritten. And if you don't know, those are copied over and over again by the time they get to our office. By the time it gets to us, it's probably been uh, copied at least four times. And not just like scanned copied, but scanned in the ER and then copied and then moved over. So it is hard to read. So some of the things that I really would like the legislature to do is just add some more damn lines to the thing. It's that's easy. That I don't even think that requires legislative action. Uh, the other thing that is important is what we don't know is um, if there's a firearm or a weapon that's been seized. There's nowhere on this that can tell us, hey, I took a firearm. There are certain uh, criteria and certain things that have to ha have to happen. If during a POW process, an officer has to, uh, has to seize a firearm from a person. So there's no way for us to know, for the court to know, that, oh, not only was this person suicidal, not only did they have a plan, but we seized a firearm from them. So we have to rely on law enforcement to tell us this. And the, as, you can, as you can see uh, through, from the beginning of this slide, this process happens very fast. Within 48 hours, we're, we're either having a hearing or, or, or we're either looking at this, these document, documents to tell us what we're gonna do with this case. And a lot of times, that officer may not even have gone back on a shift yet. So we do not know if there's a firearm seized. So I say that as, an, as any officer who fills these out. If you seize a firearm, if you seize a weapon, if they had a bat, if they had a knife, if they had anything, let us know. Um, so some pro tips on filling these out, because like I said, I see five or so a day, a, a week. Um, usually most of them are from a POW. Uh, don't be conclusory. Right? 
They were acting crazy. They were suicidal. How were they suicidal? What were they doing? What shows the substantial harm to self or others? Walking in the roadway. Um, is it illegal to walk in a roadway? Y'all can answer. It could be. Yeah, it could be. Is it illegal to go running on a roadway? It depends, right? That's a lawyer answer. Is there a sidewalk? Is there a sidewalk? If there's no sidewalk, it is not illegal to walk on the roadway as long as you're walking in the right direction. So if they were walking with their back to traffic, well, that could be illegal, right, depending on the circumstances. So, uh, I, but what I'm getting at is we need a description of how they were walking. I, I refer to this all the time because it happens all the time. Were they naked? What were they wearing? What were they doing? Uh, so the judge, the prosecutor, um, the defense attorney, the doctor, the nurse, everybody reads these POWs. Everyone does. And I, I, I saw it in this, and I beat myself up because I missed my spelling error. But I hope nobody else saw it. But if you did, I apologize. Um, but if you try to spell schizophrenia, Google it. Like, I have to do it. So just Google it, and, it, and you can, it's so much easier. Uh, who did you contact? What did they say? Get the info. Because like I said, we have here. I'll get to you when I'm done. Okay. Uh, when, uh, like I said, when, you, uh, when we read these, we don't know. We don't know who said what, when, where, why. These are, some of these may go to a hearing. Some of these may actually have three hearings, depending on the nature of it. So if I have a probable cause hearing, and I need a witness there, and I need a, a, a wife or a spouse or a brother or a mother or somebody, I need to know how to get in touch with them. And like I said, this officer may be not present. They may be off. I may not be able to get in touch with them. I've had officers as witnesses who had got off, gotten off at, seven, at 6 a.m., and I was having trial at uh, 10 a.m., 9.30, and I'm having to call them and wake them up. I'm having to send the uh, lieutenant out to go wake them up and knock on the door and say, hey, i got to have you at trial. It's 10.30. We need you. So if I have contact information for that other person, I may be able to get in touch with them. Uh, describe any weapons found. Use an extra page. Type. If you're an officer, type these. If you are with the Andrews Center, and Andrew Center, if you fill out those forms, have somebody type that. Hint, please. <laughs> type it if you can. It makes it easier. Trying to read these. Stephanie Wallace, if you're walking in right now and didn't hear what I said. <laughs> have, uh, have your clinician type it if possible because it does make it easier for us to read it. Um, it can be difficult sometimes, and a lot of that information is key information. And okay. it will be rejected by the court if yes. we can't read it. Yes, we will have to reject it if we can't read it. Um, and we've done that before. So, with 10 minutes left, we will talk about the other side of it. Um, 573001, this is the judge's order. This is basically somebody is coming to the judge, the county judge, the county court, or the probate court, and they're saying, hey, this person suffers a mental illness. They have a substantial risk of serious harm to self or others. They need immediate restraint. <laughs> that's, this is, I said that, that's the first time I've been able to set up a funny slide like that. I'm going there just for a minute. Um, so, it's the same thing, but this time it's a judge who is providing this, uh, this warrant, this this process to get the person picked up. Now, there is a different uh, mechanism to get them detained, and that's because the judge is gonna have to issue that warrant. So the judge is gonna have to go out and say, okay, officer so-and-so, now you have to go find this person and pick them up. Hopefully they're in the place where they are, or where they were supposed to be whenever this uh, process went down. Uh, they must present personally to the judge unless they're a physician. So this has come up a couple of times. There are some states that allow physicians to issue these instead of peace officers, instead of judges. 
I don't necessarily think that's a bad idea. I think it gets a lot of law enforcement out of determining what um, uh, whether someone has a mental illness, whether they need to be hospitalized. We pay doctors a fair amount of money to do that. Let's let them make that call. I think that is a great idea. If you have the ear of a legislature in the next session, or maybe a special session that may or may not be happening this year, um, talk to them. That is something that I think, I know the, the physician uh, lobby group, they may not like it, but putting this burden on law enforcement is a, it, we, we overstrain law enforcement, we overstrain law, uh, first responders, we overstrain our counselors on Oklahoma Mental Health Authority quite a bit, so I think that, is a, that would be a great idea. The physician can apply. They can apply to the judge to get that. Uh, it's the same findings as 573-001, uh, the immediate apprehension and detention, uh, and the warrant is for uh, inpatient mental health services at a local facility. So it streamlines the process. If you're going to the judge, right, the judge is already familiar with the case. We don't really have to go through, okay, Judge Donna, because I can't talk to the judge uh, as part of the ethical rules. I can't go to judge and say, hey, this is a good one. Let's, let's go ahead and sign it. Uh, God, I can. I can. Um, but you know, it streamlines that streamlines that process because the judge now is aware of it. Um, there's less law enforcement involvement initially. So if it's uh, if the person is reluctant or uh, to, to deal with law enforcement or doesn't like law enforcement, maybe this may be an option. Uh, the cons: it takes a while. This is not an easy process. Um, understanding the statute for me took ten years, and I still don't understand it. Um, and there is a cost associated with it. It is $340 to pay the county clerk to file these cases, and that money goes to the county. So the immediate process is um, the peace officer, the POW. That's the mechanism that most of these cases run into. And I, I uh, like I said earlier, 99.9% .9 of our cases originate from a POW. So that is uh, 573, the POW process and the judicial intervention or the judicial apprehension in a nutshell. I'm free to answer questions. I think we're going to have time after this right. for questions. Right. So that's all I got. Thank you.